I, for some reason, thought that it would be a good idea to make a video sharing some thoughts and ideas about entropy and how it relates to music and how it might not relate to music at all. And this is unscripted, I am completely unhinged, and this is probably what it's like to hang out with me in real life and probably why so few people choose to hang out with me in real life. I feel like I muse about entropy and drag it into casual conversation a lot in real life, and I've met a lot of really smart and clever people who don't really know the definition of it, but they remember the term from their high school physics class or something like that. If you're one of those people, you might be wondering right now, what exactly is entropy? And I guess the answer to that in its most rudimentary form is that it is the basis of the second law of thermodynamics. So pretty important stuff. In casual conversation outside of peer reviewed studies, entropy has kind of a frustratingly malleable definition. People in computer science and information systems use it a little bit differently than they use it in physics. It's even used in psychology. But for the sake of moving things along here, in physics, the most commonly understood definition of entropy is that energy becomes less orderly over time. So for example, you open up your freezer, you take out an ice cube, you put it in a cereal bowl, you put the cereal bowl on your kitchen counter, and you watch what happens. It's gonna melt into water, and it's gonna disperse over a wider area. Now you take that cereal bowl and you put it back in the freezer because you want the ice cube back. And I have bad news for you. I can almost guarantee that it's not gonna turn back into an ice cube. Why? Now, first of all, when you refreeze that ice, you're actually gonna have a little bit less of it or a little bit less volume or weight to be a bit more specific. And that's probably due to the evaporation that happened in the thawing and refreezing process. But second of all, and most importantly, it almost certainly isn't going to freeze back into a cube. But that does not mean that it is impossible that it will freeze back into that cube. It just means that it is highly unlikely. So unlikely that it has probably never happened in the history of mankind, and it probably never will happen until the end of the universe. Now, if you want to get even more specific about what's happening with that ice cube, you're probably out of luck. I can't really guide you beyond the Boltzmann constant because I am not a professional physicist or a professional mathematician. I am a professional ass. If you've ever worked in machine learning, then you've probably spent a considerable amount of time looking at TensorBoard or something similar. Over the last year, I've spent a ton of time training consensual AI vocal models, and a huge part of that is staring at TensorBoard to see when the training stops being efficient so I know when to stop training otherwise it would just be a waste of energy but another way of looking at it or I guess a more literal way of looking at it is that what that predictable graph is showing me is the entropy of improvement and I thought to myself gee if I were to graph my improvement with playing the guitar over the timeline of my life it would probably look very similar to this. When I was 12 years old, it felt like every week I was a much better guitar player than the week before. And now I feel like I haven't really improved in the last 20 years, despite playing nearly every single day. And it's the same thing for the piano and drums and other instruments I play. And come to think of it, when I look at my music composition skills or production skills or engineering skills, I notice that my improvement is entropic. But on the other hand, another thing that's entropic that might be at odds with that, and bear with me here, is our ability to remember time consistently in each day passing due to the amount of days remembered before that. So after pondering this long enough, I started diving into the overall question. Has music in general experienced entropy? Turns out that this question of mine is not all that clever or new or uncommon. There are actually a lot of peer-reviewed research papers on this very question, which is really interesting to me because this shouldn't be interesting because it doesn't really help us understand ourselves or the world around us objectively, but it still is interesting, hence why I'm making a video about it. Maybe it's just something that a PhD physicist does when they smoke weed for the first time. What does musical entropy even mean? Seriously, I have no idea what we're measuring. Is it the wider range of notes being played per song or a wider range of instruments or sounds per song graphed over a timeline of popular music releases or maybe how wide the range of cultural influence or genres are. And I don't even know how you would measure or define that. 
The most rigorously defined paper I could find is from 2017, and it's a peer-reviewed research article from Gerardo Febreze titled Music Viewed by Its Entropy Content, A Novel Window for Comparative Analysis. It uses a lot of different metrics and clever applications to look at different music genres. And do you know what I personally love about it? The notable takeaway is that there's nothing notable at all. It's like me having a clump of red sand in this hand and a clump of blue sand in this hand, throwing them both behind my shoulders and then pointing to the floor and asking you which color is more entropic. The entire exercise is so vague that it loses meaning. But what about how we feel when we listen to something, especially something that we love? Like, for the vast majority of us, that's the whole point of making or listening to music to begin with. So would musical entropy be a wider range of emotions plotted over time? Maybe, but good luck defining an emotion in a peer-reviewed paper. But I do think that this idea is worth exploring a little bit more. Oddly enough, entropy is frustratingly present in the experience of trying to describe music to another human being. The feeling of nostalgia and chills that you get from performing, playing, or hearing a song is extremely concentrated and powerful. Now describe that experience to another person in English and it becomes vague and chaotic. Perhaps the most valid or useful way of thinking about entropy in music is not in the song itself, but how we share it and what happens to it after we share it. In physics, entropy exists as a spectrum between two states, the initial state and then the final state. So how would we define a piece of music's initial state? Would it be when it's a pure idea that is about to be developed or maybe a song that has just been recorded or maybe when it's mastered or released or maybe it's the first time you hear it? Or better yet, maybe it's the first time you get it. Like the first time that you actually feel something from it. And the first time that a neural pathway is dug through your brain and associated with something meaningful. So maybe that's the moment when music is in its purest form, in its initial state that nanosecond before the Big Bang. And then the song goes on rotation in your life. It goes on your playlists and you listen to it when you're commuting to work or while you're at work, while you're at home cooking, working out. And you never really feel that initial feeling that you heard that first time you got it. And it just kind of becomes watered down and part of your life and your identity. And then you share it with some friends. Maybe you go to a birthday party and play the song there and it obfuscates the sound from how it was initially intended to be heard. Or maybe you share an mp3 file and the mp3 file gets a little bit degraded on the other end. Maybe you're a producer and you decide to sample the song and your sampled version gets more attention from the world than the original song did. Maybe it becomes an iconic gray descriptor of a genre like the Amen Break did. Or the worst of all, maybe you describe the song to somebody else via text message. You quantify everything into English words and the most specific and intense moments all of a sudden become vague descriptions that are held in superposition to someone's mood or subjective interpretation, or maybe just their opinion of you in general. How dare you? Ugh. It's interesting to me how a lot of researchers hunt for entropy in music, and I think I would actually challenge it in a lot of cases. Like, are there more notes per song than there was before? Like, is a Herbie Hancock piano piece going to have more notes and a wider range of notes than one of Bach's preludes or fugues? Yeah, almost certainly. I would also think that if you took the top 10 selling albums in the last year and compared them to the top 10 selling albums in 1950 and compared those to the top 10 selling albums in 1900, you would notice that over time, there's a wider variety of sounds and probably a lot more sounds per second of recorded audio and probably a lot more compressions and rarefactions in the waveform per millisecond so wouldn't that be neg entropy? Maybe a good metaphor for art's relationship to human psychology would be a crystal to physics. Crystals at face value are often used as fallible arguments against entropy or the second law of thermodynamics. You have all these molecules scattered around a semi-closed area just behaving normally. And then if the conditions are just right, they all work together to create this highly consolidated 
organized, beautiful object. In fact, if you ever have somebody mansplaining entropy to you, mention crystals and they'll probably change the topic. Crystals do not contradict entropy at all. They contradict the way that our brains often choose to think about entropy. And a lot of people are really grumpy with the way that people slightly misunderstand entropy or choose to think about entropy. In fact, it's a pretty popular trend on science YouTube, which I never really understood because it's not like the general public has this 360 understanding of gravity or fucking fluid dynamics and entropy is lost on them or something. I think that for most of us, the belief that things become less organized over time works very well to help us understand entropy and how the world around us works. And if my real estate agent doesn't understand the semantics of that enough to write a hypothesis off the top of her head to explain how a crystal exists in that system, I'm not upset. <laughs> I'm going to choose my words very carefully here. Entropy in physics is not solely the inevitable journey to disorder. It's just that it is almost always identical to that. And seeing it that way almost always provides an excellent metaphor to understand how it works. If I were to tell you that entropy is not the inevitable journey to disorder, it would be as wrong as me telling you that it is. Because entropy also exists as a consequence of that journey. And when we talk about it, it leads to us looking for it and cherry picking it, even in places as subjective and ambiguous as music. Did that make any sense? <laughs> I found a bunch of food coloring in my cabinet and I thought that it would be a great visual aid for this video, but it's also a great way to make cool colored crystals. A much less cool or philosophically entertaining way to describe entropy is just the number of microstates increasing in a closed system. And microstates, that just means options. And the farther we get from the first initial state, the less the probability is that we'll return to that state or find a more organized one. Veritasium's Rubik's Cube example is a great way to explain this. But if we're gonna explain how crystals forming fits into all of this, then I would prefer to use a candle and some magnets. And, and I hope my little experiment works here. So right now there's a bunch of magnetic energy concentrated within these little metal balls. But if we can make the air surrounding the metal balls hot enough, the magnetic energy will get deprioritized in the pecking order of microstates. Now once things start to cool off, that magnetic energy moves back to the top of the pecking order here, and we get to experience a localized neg entropy while the system surrounding it subsidizes that. The point is, in my studio here, entropy has still increased. Now if you put a crystal seed in a nucleation site, a similar thing is happening regarding entropy with the chemical reactions. The point of all of this is to widen our perspective and stop viewing entropy solely as something that just makes us progressively weaker and dumber every morning as we stroll through our adult lives. Back to music. Maybe as a thought experiment, we could think about music and songs and compositions and even genres as these refined, organized crystals that defy entropy in a world full of chaotic energy with war and famine and oppression and heartbreak and even love. Love is incredibly chaotic and complicated, and most of us go through our entire lives without ever understanding what it even means. And all of that is processed through a whole lot of time and experience into these audible, iconic, organized symbols of culture and identity. And while that's fascinating to think about, it's just not very useful. And perhaps music and physics should only exist together if it's helping you understand one or the other of those things. Hear me out. Music is extremely complex and it gets more and more subjective as our musical vocabulary grows. A newborn baby can only really express that it is at rest or excited. And a newborn baby composing a song would probably just be like, Wah. but eventually as the child matures, it could learn how to play or interpret something that sounds sad or silly or stressful. If you were able to find somebody who had never heard music in their entire life and you were to play a song for them, it would sound incredibly unpredictable and chaotic. But fortunately for us, we've evolved with music 
and we've honed these skills in to be very, very sharp. When I was a teenager and first started getting really into science, I used to think that music was just so weird when you think of it on the scale of human evolution. Like, for as many as 300,000 years, generation after generation after generation, we've been participating in this rhythmic and melodic exercise. Why? How does it help us? But the sound of something as simple and peaceful as walking and foraging through the woods is actually really chaotic. Recognizing patterns is imperative to foraging, and it's imperative to being able to discriminate between healthy and unhealthy paths. As I pointed out earlier, the processes of quantifying information into dialogue and language are incredibly entropic. However, communication has allowed us to build systems that has given us double the life expectancy. I hope that my previous crystal analogy makes sense now, because I guess the point of this whole video is that I believe that on its rudimentary level, music exists as a way to hone our skills to navigate an incredibly chaotic world, and that I think that music is probably a lot more critical for our survival as humans than we maybe have previously given it credit for. Or I'm on drugs, I don't know. <laughs> if you made it through my incessant rambling to this point in the video, I commend you. Your blood can probably treat people with ADHD. And if you want to see more content like this or any of the types of content that I make, or if you just want to support this channel, or if you want access to a bunch of resources for musicians, or if you want access to a bunch of unreleased music, or if you want access to a monthly songwriting challenge, then my Patreon is for you and you can join for as little as $1. Thanks for watching. Keep creating. Bye.